<clears throat> Give me Matthew chapter 12, uh, Scott, please. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 39, but he answered and said to them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The physical resurrection was a sign. A symbol of something greater spiritual. Now Jesus walked on the water. So we're all going to walk on the water? Jesus fed the 5,000 with a few fishes and loaves. So we get to share our lunch with the multitudes? Jesus coming out of the Hadean world was proven by the fact that his physical body came out of the grave. He had been to Hades. Why is Hades there to begin with, brethren? It was there because of sin. And so, when Jesus came out of the grave, he demonstrated that he had been victorious over the grave, where the creation of God was separated because of sin. He makes the payment for sin and the proof when he comes again to do away with the Jewish age that in fact he's going to take them with him and he's going to covenant it together and we're going to be gathered together. It was a spiritual picture. It's all about the physical for him. Brother Denham, I gave you 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 16. There's your reputation. We knew him after the flesh. Henceforth know we him no more. No more. That's what the Bible says. No more. Can he accept a plain statement? God has the right to qualify himself, to modify himself, to amplify himself by himself. When you make a doctrine on one particular passage, you build many times something which God never intended to build. So when the Baptists go to Romans chapter 5 and verse 1, you're justified by faith. You're justified by faith. We point out that faith can be qualified. God speaks, man hears, man obeys. And so the same way with the resurrection of Christ. It was the proof that he had come out of the Hadean world. Now, when Jesus was coming, he was coming with the keys to death and hell. Revelation 1.18. Hades. So when the old covenant world ended and the temple destroyed, the new temple of God was opened in heaven. Now I gave him Revelation chapter 11 last evening. And he said, oh, they're taking this literal. They're taking this literal. It's the temple here. Did you see? They're taking it literal as the temple. It's a sign and a symbol. Well, what's the temple then? The church? Jesus is coming to destroy the church? And he said, by the way, that the time of the Gentiles is now. It is not. Look at Luke chapter 21, 24. Brother Denham, you're crossing yourself up every which way but loose. Well, we're not going to let you loose. We're going to point out your contradictions and your doctrine. Look at Luke chapter 21 and 24. And they shall fall by the edge of the sword and shall be led away captive into all nations. And Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. The time of the Gentiles, when God allowed the Gentiles to punish the Jews, okay? As the old covenant world ended, when the Jewish age ended, the new covenant world began in completion. I asked Brother Denham last evening, because he preached the gospel first to the Jew and then to the Greek. Is that not apostolic example? 
I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God and the salvation to everyone that believes it, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In Acts 13, 46, you find Paul said it was necessary. That's an apostolic example. It was necessary to preach the gospel word of God first be spoken to you, seeing you put it off from you, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Why was there the necessity for the gospel to be preached first to the Jews? It was their age. Jesus said, go into all the world, preach the gospel for a witness, and then the end will come, the end of the age. And so when Peter said in 1 Peter 4, 7, the end of all things is at hand, the end of the ages had arrived. They had come. And then they saw the new heavens and the new earth, by the way, descending out of the heavens. By the way, the new heavens and the earth, earth, new earth came out of heaven. It wasn't heaven. Get to Revelation chapter 21, please. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, verse 1, for the first heaven, the first earth, that's uh, the old Jewish age, were passed away. There was no more sea. The sea represents the Gentiles. Now the distinction is over, that God might be all in all. It fits perfectly with 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 28. When you have a Jew, by the way, our Jew for the land, okay? There's the land, that's the earth. The sea is outside, that's the Gentiles. In Isaiah 16 and verse 5, the sea would be converted to the Lord. No more distinction, no more Jew and Gentile distinction. And that was at hand then. That's what he's talking about. And it's the full picture of the church. So now notice what he says in verse uh, 2. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem. What's the New Jerusalem? In Hebrews 12, the New Jerusalem is the church. It's the full picture of the church. It was the infancy of the church that we read about in the New Testament. It had spiritual gifts. It had no elders until Acts chapter 11. We find that it had no Gentiles in it for 10 to 12 years. They were still following Jewish diet laws in Acts chapter 10. They still were zealous of the law in Acts chapter 21 and verse 20. The infancy of the church set forth to the full picture of the church. This is what he says. And so in verse 3, I heard a voice out of heaven. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men. It was coming down out of heaven. It's not heaven. It was coming down out of heaven. It's the new Jerusalem, which is the church. Now in Acts chapter 22, we find in verse 15, for without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers, that's judgment. In the kingdom of God, there is the light of Christ, and in him we do not die. Outside of the kingdom, there is death. That's the idea and judgment. Now give me Luke chapter 20 and verse 35. I answered you, Brother Denham, with John 10 verse 28. Did he touch it? Did he even acknowledge that I answered it in John 10, verse 28, where they shall never perish? You check the Greek there in John chapter 10, 28, and then you make the distinction between Luke 20 and verse 35, please. Now, Jesus is discovering leverage marriage law. He is a Jew speaking to Jews about a Jewish concept. Under the old law, when a man had no child, his brother married his wife, if you should die without children, his, his uh, uh, brother's the man died, he would, uh, bro brother would marry her in order, the Bible says in Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 9, that his name would not go out of Israel. So it was a physical inheritance. In the resurrection life kingdom, it's not that way. It's not that way. Now look what he says in Acts 20, uh, Luke, Luke 20, 35. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age, what age are they in? They're in the Jewish age. What age is coming? The Christian age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry or given in marriage. That is, if you are worthy to obtain it, you don't obtain it with the old Jewish law. But if you want to argue the way Brother Denham does, then you would have to divorce now. Because the Bible clearly says, who are worthy to attain that age neither marry or are given in marriage. This is a classic misreading of the text. 
It's presuppositional. It is eisegesis and not exegesis. When he says, nor can they die anymore, it's no different than John 10, verse 28. Give me John 10, 28. I've said it. I've already refuted him, his doctrine. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Now tell us the differences of the Greek nuance. Did Jesus intend to teach a different doctrine here in John 10, verse 28, than he did in Luke chapter 20 and verse 35? He was talking about a nature of marriage, which they practice in order to inherit a physical land, but in the next age it would be different. So in Christ there's neither male nor female, there's bond nor free, Jew nor Gentile, but you're all one in Christ. It's not talking about substance. We still have relationships. The husband is still the head of the wife. But as far as status is concerned, standing, we have equality in standing. It's not substance, it's stance that he's talking about. Relationship with Christ that came in the new age. Now, he says, are these guys scholars? Brother Denham, I counted over four. I don't have a list. I'll get them by tomorrow. I counted over 40 versions who see it the way Vine does in the New King James Version and Young's Literal. Why do the scholars disagree? Why do they disagree about that text? Do scholars ever go to a text with translational, translational bias? Do they ever do that? And by the way, how many members of the church were these scholars that you are quoting? A man can mishandle the Greek as well as the English, and you know it. Now, because there's a difficulty with the concept of many translators, they suggest the translation of the Denim is correct. Young's literal. New King James Version. Vines. I'll get a host of them. I'll get 40 who see it our way. They see it our, exactly our way. And it makes no sense for his context. When James said the day was at hand, and now he says, well, that, it's not at hand. No, 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 no. 2 Thessalonians 2, 2 is the same thing as 2 Timothy 2, 17 and 18. They said that the day had arrived. It was a Judaistic Argument. It came from the Judaizers. They wanted the law to remain. And the law didn't go away at the cross. It went by means of the cross. And when I have time tomorrow in my affirmative, I'm going to prove that uh, uh, to you. Now he said, Paul and the Pharisees. So, Brother Denham, your argument is that Paul had to agree with the Pharisees concerning every detail of the resurrection. What they agreed to was there was a resurrection of the just and the unjust. And I already proved last night that they got it from Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, which came at the end of their age. He hid it. He didn't even touch it. What they disagreed with is that the Gentiles would be brought in by resurrection. And that's exactly what 1 Corinthians 15, 28 says. That God might be all and in all. Now give me 1 Corinthians 15, 28. Look what he says here. Now when all things are made subject to him, then the Son will also be subject to him who put all things under him. It's a perfect example, by the way, of an already but not yet. The same kind of authorities were being put down by the resurrection, would be put down by the new covenant until such time that God may be all in all. Now the connotative meaning of all in all in every text in Scripture is Jew and Gentile in equality. Colossians 3, verse 11, there's neither Jew nor Greek. Bond nor free, barbarian, scythian, uh, bond nor free, for where Christ is all and in all. Ephesians 1.21, who put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. He has a unique, unique view of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We understand scripture by interpreting scripture with scripture. What he's saying here is that, in fact, the resurrection would bring about this state. And by the way, the Corinthians weren't denying the resurrection of all of the dead ones. They wouldn't have been Christians. They weren't denying the resurrection of Christ, so we preach and so you believe. They weren't denying their own resurrection because they knew, in fact, that they would be resurrected by their baptism. You believe in resurrection. And I'll prove this, and I'll go ahead and... i got five minutes. Um... Give me, um, let's see if I'm following. 
No, give me First Thessalonians 4 first. I'll develop that later. The Corinthians did not deny the resurrection of all of the dead ones. They wouldn't have been Christians. They didn't deny the resurrection of Christ. Paul says, so we preach and so you, you, you believe. They didn't deny their own resurrection. Because if you become a Christian, you have to believe in the resurrection of Christ. If you confess with the mouth of the Lord Jesus, believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Now, who planted the church of Corinth? Paul did, 1 Corinthians 3, 6. Would he baptize people who didn't believe in the resurrection of Christ? Absolutely not. Was he a wise master builder? Demonstrably sold, 1 Corinthians 3, 10. They weren't denying the body of Christ. They were denying the body of the Jews, and I'll prove that tomorrow night. Now, give me 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. He didn't even breathe on this argument. I disproved your argument. You gave no explanation for this text. 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And here's the time indicator. When you have a time indicator in the text, then you must interpret the scripture around the time indicator. And clearly he says, Now the may of God uh, of peace himself be sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Brother Denham, that's plain English enough. Your whole spirit, soul, and body. And I'll tell you the truth. When I was a student at Tennessee Bible College, I scratched my head years ago. How can this be? Why would Paul say your whole spirit, soul, and body? Is that the physical body? Be preserved blameless into the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. How could he say this? Do we have old Thessalonians living today? Is he saying get your body preserved by a wonderful mortician? No. He was giving the Thessalonians hope who were in persecution and Jesus was coming. And so I interpret the events by the time indicator. You have to do that in order to be consistent with Scripture. And so now we find that in Hebrews 10 verse 37, as the eminence is increasing, Hebrews 10 37, he's coming in a very, very little while. But because... The event doesn't satisfy his fleshly view of things. He says this hasn't happened. Now quickly, give me 1 John 2 and verse 8. Again, a new commandment I write to you. Uh, because the darkness is passing away. Check, check your uh, verb right here. Check your Greek. The darkness is passing away. The darkness of the age was to pass. Give me 1 John 2 verse 18. How much time do I have? Two and a half minutes. Right, thank you. Okay. Little children, it is the last hour, all right? The eminence is increasing. John writes about 68. It's the last hour. How do we know it's the last hour? As you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. Jesus predicted many false prophets would come. In that generation, the love of the many would wax cold. They knew the last hour had arrived. He's got the last hour for 2,000 years. And by the way, in 2,000 years from now, it's still going to be the last hour because God stays out of time. By the way, 2 Peter chapter 3, there are three sets of heavens and earth. Not one of them had reference to cirrus clouds and rocks and dirt. They are ages. That's what's uh, re re referred to. Now, look at verse 25. Uh, 20, but you have an anointing from the Holy One and you know all things. That's the Holy Spirit giving them revelation. It's not. It's for them. All right, give me verse 25 now, please. All right, uh, yes. And this is the promise that he has promised, eternal life. These things that I've written unto you, those who try to deceive you, but the anointing which you have received from him abides in you. This is the Holy Spirit. This is the sealing of the Spirit. It was anointing them so that they would not be ashamed in his coming. Keep, keep on going to first, uh, give me uh, verse, <coughs> first John 3, 1. Quickly, quickly, Okay. Behold the manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. We should be called the children of God. And the children of God, the bond, it was about to be made known to the liberty of the sons of God. Romans chapter 8. So he says, Beloved, now we are the children of God. It has not yet been revealed what we shall be. But we know that when he is revealed, that's Luke 17 verse 30. In the day when the Son of Man is revealed, he shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We're conformed to the image of his Son. It is the day that has gone. It is a revelation. It's the completion of a relationship with God so that you know Christ. Are you not like Him? Shall we not be like Him? We must be like Him. We must see Him face to face. 1 Corinthians 13, 10 is 1 John 3, 2. He can make fun of it. I know it's the same. 
And in fact, that's the only way you should look at the scripture, because if you look at it in a different way, you still got the anointing. Are you still anointed by the Holy Spirit? Do you know all things by the Holy Spirit? Does He dwell in you? Are you a miraculous indweller? Uh, 